Watch this. You ask, we answer. After a busy week, we're taking a look at your questions on a collection of COVID topics. One month into the school year, and tracking COVID cases varies from district to district. Turns out, so does notifying parents of an exposure. And from the KTVB archives, a sweet old pup whose goal in life is to play tetherball. An all-time Idaho life favorite from Brian Holmes. Let's start our weekend out on a good note. Well, it was a tough week for the state of Idaho. The COVID situation here has gotten progressively worse in recent days and weeks. St. Luke's Chief Medical Officer Dr. Frank Johnson outlined for me how in several metrics the health system has gotten worse in just the single week it's been since crisis standards of care were declared for the entire state of Idaho. As we chronicled that this week, we saw a lot of great questions from you stemming from our stories and a popular topic this week is our conversation with Ada County Coroner Dottie Owens. A common question after that story was about death certificates and if the county coroner makes the declaration that a death was COVID related. So for all of you asking, here's what the coroner has to say. Depends on if it's um, jurisdictionally a coroner case. There are some that come in um, that you will see that we sign out. There's some that the hospital signs out. I, I authorize all the cremations for Ada County. Every cremation that happens in Ada County, we actually have to review the death certificate and we're pulling a lot of the data off of that and they're being vetted backwards, right? We're verifying that those are COVID deaths. And she adds that there are checks and balances within the entire system between the hospitals and the coroner's office just to make sure that every COVID death is confirmed and attributed correctly. Uh, Coroner Owens told me that they don't want to ever give the impression that Idaho numbers or Ada County numbers are inflated or wrong. So they work very closely to ensure that everything checks out. Another comment we saw after our story touched on funeral homes and how they are dealing with the increase in COVID deaths in our community. Now, Owen says from what she is seeing firsthand, yes, funeral homes are having some issues with the curve, the COVID surge. I have two funeral homes that have actually chosen to opt out of our rotation, our monthly rotation, because they just they're full and they can't handle any more cases from us. Actually checked in with the number of funeral homes in the valley this past week and all but one had the exact same feedback. They are very busy in getting to the point where they have concerns about what's next and they share that concern with the medical community. Well, there's been a lot of discussion and confusion about school districts and how they differ with different COVID rules. Some districts like the Boise School District, for example, it is a requirement that you wear a mask in school. Other districts like West Ada, they had different rules, but they are at a point now in West Ada where there is a mask mandate. And we're going to talk about that later on in this show, but we're seeing different things in different districts and tracking the number of cases. We know it's not easy. That's something we've heard from many surrounding school districts. But now we're even hearing this. There's different reports about how school districts are actually looking at exposure. We're looking at that according to students and parents because they tell us that if there's an exposure of COVID in their class, depends on what school district they're in, depending on the protocol. Our Andrew Bartline joins us right now. And Andrew, I know you looked in this today and we were talking to a parent who's in the Valley View School District. She says that there are five COVID cases in their students' classroom and they tell us that the district never notified them about that. What is this parent saying about the situation at Valley View? Yeah, well, that's exactly right, Joe. And it actually aligns with the Valley View School District policy. They actually call it a procedure. And that's exactly what made that parent so upset. And we'll hear from her in a moment. But first, we're going to look at Valley View's policy. Uh, like I said, they call it a procedure. Now, the percentage of students reported to be out and be sick is really important. So once a school passes 3%, of their students and staff reporting positive cases. That's the moment when the Valley View School District will begin to contact trace and begin notifying parents if their kids were exposed before 3%. They're not going to do that. So even while several students come down with COVID in the same classroom, it's likely that parents won't be notified in the Valley View School District, and that's what's led to this whole list of problems for this Valley View family, as you'll hear right now. Just a simple email or a text that says, hey, your kid has been exposed. I would never have let my children be around my parents. Their babysitter watched them Saturday. And since then, nine people have come down with COVID from my one child, including myself. Um, that's a big deal. My parents being one of, you know, two of them. And that 
that's what upsets me the most. We have been very, very careful. We do our part. We're respectful um, of other people and we're quarantining now. We don't go out, but we were being very careful, especially around my parents and all that is for naught because the school district said, eh, we'll, we'll update the website. So, Joe, we looked around at other school districts to see if this policy aligns with what we're seeing around the Treasure Valley and in Idaho, if that's normal compared to others. So we talked with Dan Holler, the spokesperson at the Boise School District. He says an email is going to be sent out to students, family and staff. If there's a positive case report in a classroom, like in an elementary school or at a high school, it'll go to the whole school. Kathleen Tuck at the Nampa School District says something very similar. All parents will be notified again through email. If there's a case reported in their schools, the West Ada School District, we talked with Char Jackson, their spokesperson. She said something very similar. Uh, people are notified if there are close contacts after an infectious person was in the classroom. So a little more narrow in the West Ada School District, but in this case with Heather, she certainly would have been notified with five people in one classroom. So all of these districts sort of have more proactive measures as they're notifying parents rather than expecting parents to seek out the information themselves to go on the website and check every day or, or something like yeah. that. That's, that's what they'd have to do if, if that's gonna be a policy that works to get the word out. And it, I know this is very difficult for parents in different school districts because, I mean, how do you weigh, I guess, different decisions as we heard in your story. If you don't know your kid's sick, do you go visit grandma and grandpa? Yeah, and that's exactly what she was so upset about was she just didn't know. Now she could have looked on the school website, but I'm not sure how well that was communicated to her that if you want to know, we're not going to get that information to you or be proactive to let you know you got to seek it out yourself. And that really made her upset. Well, Andrew, keeping an eye on this and it's interesting to compare and contrast with different area school districts are doing with their policy. So thank you for the report, Andrew. Thank you. And staying with schools, we did want to share this update with you. Idaho's largest school district, the West Ada School District, they announced today that they are maintaining their mask requirement through October 8th. In an email to parents today, West Ada said, quote, we have actively reviewed our district data, hospital data, and the impact of COVID-19 on our health care system. Our community is still at a high level of community transmission, and Idaho has expanded its crisis standards of care due to the variant surge. End quote. And here's some notes that you need to know about the extension here. The mask requirement is still going to apply to all students, staff and visitors in the West Data School District. And West Data tells us they will continue to temporarily suspend all mask opt out forms that they received from families earlier this year. Important to note, though, medical mask exemptions on file with the student school nurse will remain in place. Individual mask accommodations or exemptions is documented in a student's learning plan will also remain in place. So we've seen your question over the last few weeks and days about the worsening situation and notably a week ago with crisis standards of care. People asking, will these things matter in terms of public policy? Well, we're seeing, for example, here at the West Ada School District that the current situation is certainly influencing their public policy. Stick around, we've gathered up some of your most asked questions from this week, and we're going to take a look at them. And also, make sure you keep sending us your questions and comments, too. You can send them to us anytime. You know the number, 208-321-5614. Just be sure to include your name and hashtag the 208, and we're going to end today's show by sharing some of your texts. So make sure you're there for the end of the show. But before we get to that point, more importantly, Messages of thanks to our healthcare workers.
It's Friday, which means it is time to come through all of your messages that you sent us in this week, and we're going to answer as many as we can real quickly here. These are the ones we couldn't get to this week. We'll start with this one from Britt saying, I keep seeing GoFundMe requests for help with funeral costs for COVID deaths. FEMA is offering funeral assistance of up to $9,000. Maybe there needs to be more coverage about this benefit. And I think that it's a good point you make and you're 100% correct. FEMA, of course, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, they launched this program that we referred to a second ago back in April as a part of the American Rescue Act plan, ARPA. You can get up to $9,000 or up to $35,000 for multiple deaths. However, there are a lot of stipulations if you are going to go through this FEMA funeral program. You have to be a U.S. citizen, a non-U.S. citizen, national, or qualified immigrant to apply. The death must have occurred after January 20th, 2020, and must have happened in the United States. You'll have to submit a number of documents, including the death certificate, which must indicate that the death was directly or indirectly attributed to COVID. If you are approved, that money can help cover funeral services, cremation, headstones, or markers, as well as burial plots, among a large list of other things. As of now, there is no deadline to apply. However, applications are only accepted over the phone. And if you have any questions or looking for more details on this, you can go to our website right now, ktvb.com. We do know this, so far, 624 applications have been submitted from Idahoans. And as of today, 331 have been approved totaling more than $1.9 million in aid. More questions for you. Shannon from Boise asks, what is the percentage of vaccinated Idahoans? I keep seeing different numbers. It's a good question, and this is a little confusing just because there are so many different numbers and categories to dig through, but let's dive into this together. This is the Idaho vaccine dashboard homepage, which is available on the public website. You can go look at this anytime. What we're focused on, though, is the chart that you'll see on the left side of your screen there. It shows Idaho's vaccine numbers, and what we're looking at is that complete number, meaning that people are completely vaccinated, whether that was through a two shot series or they took the single Johnson and Johnson shot. Now that first number, 51.5%, it shows the percentage of Idahoans 12 and older who are completely vaccinated. Now it's 12 and older because the shot is available to those 12 and older. So of course it does not include those under 12. So 51.5% of Idahoans who are eligible to get the shot have done so. And that middle number, 54.1% shows Idahoans over the age of 18 who have gotten the shot. And finally, 77.2% shows those over the age of 65 who are completely vaccinated. So I hope that info helps. Finally, from Lori, she asks, are the COVID deaths that you report of people who were vaccinated or unvaccinated? And to answer your question in, in a word, the answer is both. But the state has started to break down deaths by vaccinated versus unvaccinated. And the chart we're going to show you is available on the state's COVID dashboard. Just click the case characteristics tag there. Again, all this available to the public at any time. An important note, this is just data from after May 15th, 2021, because that was the day that the vaccine was officially made available to everyone 12 and older in the state of Idaho. All the way on the far left is the fully vaccinated column. And as of yesterday, 57 deaths of the 514 COVID deaths were in vaccinated Idahoans. On the far right is the not fully vaccinated column, meaning patients were either not vaccinated at all or in the middle of a two dose shot. 457 of the reported 514 deaths were in unvaccinated Idahoans. Again, all of this data is available publicly at any time on the state of Idaho's COVID website. All right, that's enough seriousness for the week, and let's end it all up with some fun stuff. And by fun, we mean making fun of a very young Brian Holmes, who met a dog that just could not stop playing tetherball. You have to see this one. And it's also last call. Send us your questions and comments before we head out for the weekend. The number is 208-321-5614. Send us your name and the hashtag the 208 so we know who sent us the text. And we're going to share as many as we can at the end of the show.
We wanted to get to this story yesterday, but we ran out of time. Busy week, but we do want to still share this. We were browsing through some old Idaho newspapers and we saw a for sale ad that made us do a double take at least. And be warned, this is going to make your head explode. How about this? A hundred years ago, yesterday, a Meridian man named John Mills placed an ad in both the Meridian Times and the American Falls Press saying, quote, for sale, 30 acres near Meridian for $100 per acre, $600 will be will handle all can be irrigated. Good soil three miles south of Meridian signed John Mills. That was in 1921. A hundred years later, that land, if you can find it, it would be in the tens of millions of dollars range. Inflation. Am I right? Joe, I wish I could give my forecast with such uh, comedic enthusiasm. Beautiful day. Yeah, such gusto. You got that right. Uh, top 10 weather day, in my opinion, 82 degrees in Boise. McCall at 74, 72 in the Haley Sun Valley area. Beautiful blue skies. Finally kicked out the smoke. It's fall. It's the first weekend of fall ahead of us this weekend, but it'll feel and look a little more like summer. Next 12 hours, staying in the low to mid 60s, even around midnight tonight. So maybe it's a nice backyard fire pit kind of night or just hanging out in the backyard, grilling up dinner. Magic Valley forecast for tomorrow, a crisp, cool start wrapping up the day with highs in the low to mid 80s. Even our mountains will be warming up tomorrow, warmer than today. And a similar story over into the West Central Mountains where council comes in with a high of 84 tomorrow, 86 in Garden Valley, a lot of sunshine. But when I say that it'll feel and look more like summer tomorrow, I'm talking about a little increased wildfire smoke. It won't be socked in, but it may make for hazy sunshine through the weekend, and that is because of the southwest flow aloft. If you're heading to Logan, Utah for the game tomorrow, because it's early in the day, it will be cool, especially for the first half of it. But I'm thinking maybe around halftime or fourth quarter, you're shedding the BSU jacket to just the BSU t-shirt or perhaps the BSU tank top. I don't know what your fashion sense is. High pressure is in control for us. And as I mentioned before, getting a little increased wildfire smoke that's coming in from Northern California. So unfortunately, we don't have bluebird skies for the weekend, but all things considered, it is a beautiful forecast for the weekend with above average temperatures. Chilly changes are on the way for us come Tuesday. You've been warned because it will be a significant difference in temperature and also in feel. We'll have some pretty blood blustery wind coming in out of the northwest and even some wet weather is a chance for the Treasure Valley, very likely for our mountain locations. And again, these changes come into play on Tuesday and look at these cold looking colors behind that cold front, dropping our temperatures by at least 20 degrees from highs on Monday to high temperatures on Tuesday. Then we get a little closer to seasonal averages as we cruise into the end of next week and maybe head into more of a fall feeling weekend next weekend. You can always find the freshest forecast at, at KTVB.com. That was my gusto, Joe. <laughs> ah, that's some really good gusto on a Friday. Well, a lot of you have noticed this texting us in. Um, Brian's been gone for essentially the entire week, and this has actually been the first week since the 208 began last year that Brian wasn't at the helm. He was able to enjoy some much deserved time off before working yesterday on that story inside the ICU at St. Alphonsus in Boise, and he's working on that story right now. He's going to have a special story coming up on Sunday night on the news at 10 and then next Monday. So in a few days from now, we're going to have an extended version of Brian's uh, story inside the ICU coming up on this Monday. But we've all missed Brian this week, and I'm sure some of you have too. seen all the comments, uh, but we decided that the best way to really end the week would be to dig into the deep archives and by dig deep. I mean, we're going real deep into this one, like below the basement. This is a 17 year old Idaho life from a very young Brian Holmes. Well, the neighbors brought over some things. They At had. Joanne Meyer's yard sale. We already sold their lawnmower. Everything must go. Stools, benches. From the race car to the Chinese checkers. Everything's for sale here. Even this old chair, but not this old dog. No, uh-uh. He's a keeper. He is, he's a keeper. He's DJ, and he's 13 years old. He likes raspberries, likes the water, and he loves 
tetherball. Yep, he just does this by himself. He's ruined more tetherball balls. DJ's had a nose for the game since he saw Joanne's grandkids playing it eight years ago. And he decided he liked what they were doing, and so he started doing it too and made the kids really mad because he he can do just as good as they do. Sure, he's 91 in dog years. Oh, it's amazing. He's just amazing. He may be a bit hard of hearing. He's totally deaf. He cannot hear a sound. But he knows his way around and around and around a tetherball pole. <laughs> Something Joanne. Oh, Deej, you're pretty funny. Never no. tires from watching. Nobody does. Even when no one is watching, DJ will play. And just when you think he's all tethered out, say how do you know when he's Now he's hot. That's 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 when you know he's done. Yeah. He's ready for another round. Doing something dogs just don't usually do. I don't think he thinks he's a dog. Brian Holmes. The dog and his ball. <laughs> Idaho's News Channel 7.
That's one of my favorite spots in the entire world. Uh, let's finish off the show with some questions, comments. This person says, hey, Joe, has anyone looked into the cost for people who get put in the ICU? Are families being saddled with huge expenses? Is that from Ralph? I can tell you um, we're trying to get a real number on what an ICU stay could look like, but Dr. Frank Johnson with St. Luke says, Yes, uh, without giving a specific number, these are very, very expensive stays and they are costing families a lot of money. Uh, what else we got here? I think we have one more for the week. This one says, when you test positive for COVID, what day do you use to figure out how long you should quarantine? It is the day that you were first symptomatic. So that is what you want to look out for there. Brian returns on Monday. We all return on Monday. Everyone be healthy and happy this weekend. We'll see you next week.